This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Our nation is the richest society the world has ever known. At the same time, this materialism has been like a thin coat of varnish which cannot hide a deeper spiritual hunger that will not go away. People have tried to find happiness and peace of heart and mind in a multitude of ways through pleasure, possessions, power, relationships. Yet many have come to realize what King Solomon found to be true some 3,000 years ago. Of all people, King Solomon, sitting in peaceful security on the throne, which David had built with riches and honor, splendor, power, living in almost fable luxury, Solomon should have been the one man in all the world we would call happy. But listen to what he says, as recorded in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Anything I wanted, I took, and did not restrain myself from any joy. I even found pleasure, great pleasure, in hard work. This pleasure was, indeed, my only reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had tried, it was all so useless, a chasing of the wind, and there was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Some people would say, we really need a new prescription for our ills. But I believe this is not what we really need. Our greatest need today is not for a new prescription, but for a bigger dose of the original medicine. When a nation or an individual turns away from those things that gave peace and prosperity in the very beginning, then the real cure is not in seeking some new wonder drug. The real answer lies in going back and applying the original thing that worked back then. We don't need to change the prescription. We need to change the dosage. Let me tell you a corny little story silly story, to illustrate what I'm talking about. A doctor told this fellow to take three pills home with him, and if he could keep them on his stomach overnight, then he would be well the next morning. The fellow came back to the doctor the next day complaining, Doc, I don't think I'll ever get well. I put these three pills on my stomach, but every time I rolled over, they fell off. Well, that's a crazy little story, isn't it? But aren't we much like that uninformed patient? The prescription from God's word is still the answer, but we're not taking it internally like we should. We don't want it to penetrate us and become a part of us. Frankly, some people become so accustomed to their sick condition, they don't care much about changing. Our need is not to change the prescription, but to change the dosage. When Peter preached to Cornelius and his household, as recorded in Acts chapter 10, he preached the gospel of Jesus. He was committed to preaching the truth. Peter was convinced that the only hope was salvation through Jesus. Just simply knowing about Jesus is not enough. It is possible to appreciate Jesus without knowing the gospel personally. Jesus did not come to this earth to draw people to him, for them to admire him. The Bible said the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. If Jesus had come just to seek other people, then he would have had no difficulty from many others. Jesus came to save the lost humanity. We can't get to heaven just by liking some of the things Jesus did. If the world could have been saved simply by having Jesus bring people up to a higher cultural level, 
then there would have been no reason for him to have died on the cross. There are some people who may appreciate Christ's influence on music and art and literature. They think that because they are cultured, they're saved. Not so. They're just cultured, lost people. This is the trouble with many of our churches, not only in America, but surely elsewhere as well. When the gospel of Jesus is not applied to the lives of church members, then that church is dead. I read some time ago a contrast between a living and a dead church. Let me share this with you. Live churches are filled with people with Bibles in hand. Dead churches are not. Live churches are intense and earnest about praise. Dead churches are not. Live churches have parking problems. Dead churches do not. Live churches have lots of noisy youth. Dead churches do not. Live churches move by faith. Dead churches inch along by sight. Live churches support missions very heavily. Dead churches keep all their money at home. Live churches focus on people. Dead churches focus on problems in the church. Live churches are filled with tithers. Dead churches are filled with tippers. Live churches have the fresh wind of love constantly blowing. Dead churches are given to bickering. Live churches evangelize. Dead churches fossilize. And I might add to this list that live churches are those that continue applying the basic gospel of Jesus and his love, while dead churches are frantically seeking some clever new way to attract people to them. No, we don't need to change the prescription. We need rather a bigger dosage of the real thing. When Jesus Christ lived, he died, he rose from the dead, and he lives today, he continues to draw people to himself. Just knowing these facts, though, is not enough. Our only hope is by participating, receiving, internalizing these truths as we take Jesus as our own personal Savior and Lord. But what happens when an individual or a church gets serious about making Jesus Lord? Is it all smooth sailing after that? Oh, no, not at all. When a strong enough dosage of the gospel is given, there will inevitably be some kind of a reaction. Do you know what a healing medicine is? It is a medicine that kills. When there is an infection in the body, the medicine which is given must kill that harmful germ or germs which are present. When you were a young child, did you have a have a cut on your hand or foot, go crying to your mother and have her put some kind of medication on that cut to make you feel like you've been set on fire. As you were dancing around and blowing the cut place, perhaps you were told, wait a minute now, if it burns, that means it's doing good. Oh, I've heard that so many times. This is the truth of, truth of life, though, especially with the gospel. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, it is impossible for everybody to like it. A few minutes ago, I referred to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 10. Only a few chapters later, Acts 13, we have the account of Paul's sermon to the Jews at Antioch. You know what the reaction to that sermon was? Verse 45 says, some of them were, quote, filled with envy and spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then later in verse 50, we read, but the Jews stirred up the devout, honorable women and the chief men of the city 
and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. There are some things Paul could have preached on, and everybody would have liked it. As he looked out over those Jews to whom he was speaking, Paul could have said to himself, Now let me think. Today I think I'll talk about the greatness of Abraham. Maybe I ought to talk about the wonderful work of Moses. I believe these people who are going to be listening to me would really like me if I recounted the great things that God did at the Red Sea or how he gave manna from heaven or how he guided the Hebrews by a pillar of fire at night, by a cloud at day. Paul had to make a decision, though, that he want everybody to leave that day saying, oh, what a nice fellow Paul is. Or was he going to say, Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, was raised from the dead, and without him, you cannot be saved. Paul chose to preach the gospel of Christ, and it brought trouble for him. This is just, there's just no way in which the world can get crusaders without getting opponents. You can get bystanders, spectators, but you cannot stand firm and practice the way of Jesus Christ without getting opponents. What I'm trying to say here is that there's no way to move forward in obedience to Christ without encountering some opposition. Perhaps you've heard me say before, you've never seen a dog barking at a car that's parked in the driveway. When people get serious about moving out with Christ and faith, when a strong enough dosage of the gospel, the real truth is taken, then there's going to be some kind of reaction. Of course, we could have it the other way. We could just dry up on the vine, be content to hold our own. Some people would be happy, thinking, I just want to be a member of a little church. One church called a preacher who was not really known for his good preaching. It was an affluent church. They had plenty of money, a lot of rich people in that church. So the preacher sat down with some of the leaders before he was asked to come as their pastor. And he said to them, I don't understand why you want me as your preacher. I can't preach that well. I, in fact, I can't do anything well. Why would you call me? The leaders said, well, preacher, the pulpit committee told us that you were not likely to draw any people to our church. And, you know, we just hate a crowded church. So they got their man. One lady told the preacher, I never did like a preacher who really preached. You are my type. <laughs> oh, sir, how sad. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached and lived, it is going to cause some trouble. Let a law enforcement officer do his job. He's going to have trouble. Can you imagine such a person who says to a motorist, Oh, that's all right. I saw you break the law. You just go right on through that light. It's okay. I don't want to slow you down. Or a law enforcement officer saying, If you want to rob that bank, don't let me stand in your way. I would not want to offend you. Some people are turned off by honest, sincere, dedicated Christians because they show others up for what they really are. That's why some young folks are ostracized, excluded, when they won't go along with the crowd in drinking, partying, smoking pot, or taking pills, or things like that. This is what makes some young girls unhappy when one among them holds true to her moral convictions and standards. Others may respect her deep in their hearts, but she bothers them because they know that they ought to be just like her but they don't have the Christian courage to do it. Billy Graham once received a letter from a young girl who had just turned 16. Here's what she said. Mr. Graham, I have tried everything in my search for happiness, alcohol, sex, drugs, you name it. But my life is still empty, meaningless, or it was. And then I turned to Christ 
and my life is completely changed now. That story could be echoed by countless people, not just young people, but older ones alike. In this modern, frenzied, rushed world, don't be confused by all the sights and sounds you hear. There is a person called Jesus Christ, and without him, your life is absolutely nothing. With him in your life and in your heart, you can have a happy, meaningful life blessed life here on earth, and his promises of a home in heaven. Without him, you can spend a life of hell on this earth, as well as an eternity in heaven, or rather in hell. I want to share with you in closing uh, some words by a person who is very well known, if I were to call his name, but... uh, he talks about your your final epitaph. How, how would like, uh, how would you like to be remembered after your death? If you have considered what the epitaph on your gravestone might read, one headstone in in uh, England, marking the grave of a woman named Anna Wallace, reads like this. This is words on her gravestone. The children of Israel wanted bread, and the Lord sent them manna. Old clerk Wallace wanted a wife, and the devil sent him Anna. Oh, not only the final words of Anna that she expected to have on her tombstone, I'm sure, but as always, those who left behind got the last word. Sometimes that happens. You have to cringe and wonder when you see the gravestone of a man from Plymouth, Massachusetts, named John McMahon. On his tombstone were written these words. He was a failure as a husband and a father. How would you like that to be on your tombstone as your legacy? But the saddest epitaph of all is not found on a tombstone. It is found in the pages of Scripture. When faced with the task of memorializing the wise King Solomon, God had some sobering words. Solomon has abandoned me, abandoned me. He has worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. He has not followed my ways and done what is pleasing in my sight. He had not obeyed my laws and regulations as his father David did. Solomon was buried in the city of David, and in spite of all the good things he did, he will be forever remembered as the king who turned his back on God. We'd all do very well to ask ourselves a very simple question. If God were to write my obituary, what would he record? Well, where do you stand today? What's your problem? Is it that of prescription or dosage? Do you know the truth? Have you taken that truth internally? Do you believe the gospel on the inside as well as just in your brain? If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. I'm going to ask you this morning to make that an all-important decision, a step to commit your life to Jesus Christ, to confess your sin to him, to receive his pardon. Perhaps you've known for a long time that this decision has been staring you in the face, but you've kept putting it off. You will not really have any peace down inside until you settle that matter with God. Today's the day. Now's the time. The decision is yours. What's it going to be? Oh God, we pray that the one listening to my voice right now who's been putting off that decision of surrendering life and heart and everything to you, may today, right now, be that time, that day. Thank you, God, for the fact that you love us. You keep on knocking at our heart's door until we let you in. We pray that the one listening to my voice right now may experience that real peace within of knowing Jesus Christ personally as Savior and Lord. 
This we pray in his wonderful name. Amen.